Well, welcome to this session here at Davos, an insight, an idea with Joseph Stiglitz. I'm Stephanie Flanders, the BBC's economics editor, and we're here to discuss the big idea of many that you've had about the price of inequality, the cost of inequality, um, which you've written a book about. I should say, I suspect most of the people here don't need any introducing to you, but I have over the years noticed, you know, some people get more conservative as they get older. That doesn't seem to have happened to you, <laughs> fair to say. Nobel Prize winning economist. I think maybe even one of a handful of, of very senior economists, some of them Nobel Prize winning winners, who seem to have become more radical or been made more radical by developments in the global economy over the last um, 20 years. Uh, and you've, been, you've managed to be a sort of thorn in the side of the establishment, even when you held very prominent positions inside that establishment uh, as chief economist of the World Bank, as uh, head of the Council of Economic Advisors for the president. And you've uh, put, your, put your brain and your, your focus on the cost of the Iraq war. You wrote about uh, the cost of the uh, action in Afghanistan this morning for the Financial Times. You also, many of much of your academic work that you won the Nobel Prize for came in very handy in thinking about the failings that had gone into the financial crisis. So you've been contributing to a lot of debates. But I think over the last couple of years, and certainly for the purposes of this session, we want to focus on your thoughts about inequality, the, the sheer extent of inequality uh, the, its rise over the last 20 years, what's driving it. And I guess what's particular about your book that I was struck by was also saying the price of inequality, that this isn't just a sort of hand-wringing exercise, that it is actually um, causing us damage. So I guess, I mean, I guess the first question would just be, um, I, I guess it's not an invitation to give us your sh most shocking statistic, but you know, what do you think is really the shocking thing about the rise in inequality over the last couple of decades, or how would you characterize well, well, it? Well, let me just pick up on one point that you made, that, that uh, you know, there's a moral issue of, of inequality and the problems of poverty. Uh, but one of the, uh, maybe almost the central theme of my book is that we as a society, our democracy, and our economy is paying a very high price for the magnitude of the inequality that has been achieved in the United States, achieved, I'm not sure is the right word, but <laughs> uh, uh, that, that inequality has reached and the way that inequality has, has grown. And you know, inequality has many dimensions. It's the fraction of income at the top, it's the howling out of the middle, it's the increase of poverty at the bottom. But I guess in terms of, of, of a couple numbers that, that are striking, um, one of them is, of course, the share of national income that goes to the top 1%, something like between 20 and 25%. And if you look at the top one-tenth of percent, that, that has also increased enormously. Um, this is not inevitable, and it's not always been this way. The share of the top 1% has doubled since 1980. The share of the top one-tenth of 1% has tripled since 1980. The statistic that, uh, statistics in my book that have resonated the most though that have caused sort of the, uh, you might say the waking up is the statistics about opportunity equality. America likes to think of itself as a land of equality of opportunity, American dream. And it's very deep in, in our sense of our identity. And uh, we, castigate old Europe as, you know, ossified. Uh, well, the statistics show otherwise, that the United States has the least equality of opportunity, or at least one of the worst equal, uh, opp opportunity of any of the advanced industrial countries. And what does that mean? That means a child's lifetime prospects are more dependent on the education and income of his parents than in almost any of the other advanced industrial countries. And the chances of somebody moving from the bottom to the top, or bottom to the middle, are just much, much lower in the United States than, for instance, in Scandinavia. Mm. But you said it's not inevitable, it's not always been this way. I mean, what has driven the last few decades? Because some people would say 
it has been an inevitable price of the rise of a more global economy, greater competition, and that in a, it may sort of yet follow a, follow a curve downwards, that we've had this big change in the global economy and that's produced sure. all this inequality and winner take all, but that won't necessarily last. What driving it do you think? Well, I mean, that's one of the main points I try to raise in the book because market forces are global. Uh, they're the same market forces on both sides of the Atlantic, both sides of the Pacific, and yet the outcomes are markedly different. Uh, and so you can't just say it's market forces. Mm. Scandinavia has taken those same market forces, grown more rapidly, and uh, much more equality. What's even striking is that there are some countries in the world today in which inequality is coming down. So there are not very many. You I mentioned Brazil, actually. Brazil is an yeah. example of a country where inequality reached a very high level. And one way of thinking about what happened is they looked over the brink. They said, that's not the way we want to go. And a bipartisan consensus, left, right, started doing things like investing in education for all, uh, a whole set of social welfare pr uh, programs, nutrition for all, including for children, health care for all for children. And what's striking is in less than 20 years, you can see it in the macroeconomic data. And that's really, really very striking. Do you, uh, you draw a parallel, we're gonna, we'll get to a minute in sort of terms of what can be done, whether, we could, whether you could follow the Brazilian example or make much of an inroads into this. But just to go a little bit more on the, on the causes, uh, take us through the parallel with the 1920s and 30s, because you do in the book, you describe some similarities between that time and what we've been living through the last 20 years. Yeah, there are a number of parallels. One of them, of course, is that uh, the last time inequality got as high as it did was in the roaring 20s. Mm. And both, both of those episodes ended in disaster. Uh, the, uh, the other interesting thing is the, the other two periods in which inequality in the United States got very high, which is the Gilded Age, is the, the other one at the end of the 19th century, were followed by very strong social reforms that brought down inequality. So you had the progressive era after the Gilded Age, you had the social legislation, social security, um, minimum wages, uh, collective bargaining, a whole set of reforms that really did change the way our economy functioned. And led to periods of very rapid growth, but unlike the growth since 1980, it was shared economic growth. Uh, and that is really the, the interesting thing. The periods in which there's been shared economic growth have been periods in which there's been more rapid economic growth. But you, and you talk about the fact that the, you know, the 20s was followed by financial crisis, the same period of very rising inequality followed by financial crisis. What, is the, what was the link that was, do you, would you link those two things? And is that one of the costs of inequality as you would see it? Well, uh, one of the, what I, what I said is one of the concerns about inequality is the way it's generated. And um, there's an old theory in economics going back to the 19th century where people wanted to understand, uh, you might say, justify the inequality. There's a theory called marginal productivity theory that said that the reason some people get more income than others is they contribute more. So that idea gave a moral justification to inequality and then it said we have to have that inequality to incentivize people. So it's not only a moral justification but it was a economic benefit. And then people, the, a lot of the literature over the last 150 years and the discourse has been that there's a trade-off. We could only get uh, less inequality if we gave up on economic growth. Well, if we look at the inequality in the way that it's been uh, realized in the United States, a lot of it has to do with what we call rank seeking. That is to say, rather than making the national pie bigger, getting a bigger share of that pie. And we're used to thinking of natural resource economies as rank seeking economies where there's a fixed amount of natural resources, there's fighting over who gets those natural resources, and in that process, a lot of wealth gets destroyed. And those countries are, 
you know, democracy doesn't work, the economies don't work. It's called the natural resource paradox. The interesting thing is, without realizing it, several of the advanced industrial countries, including the United States, have to a large extent, not totally, become rank-seeking economies. And it's not just the natural resource sector, which often gets the resources at below competitive prices. Um, That's Washington. But, but the financial sector. Um, and, um, you know, when the financial sector engaged in abusive credit card practices, predatory lending, they were taking money from the bottom of the pyramid and moving it to the top. Uh, in other cases, when they were... So in that sense, it, it, there it was directly contributing also to the instability, that the, the excesses of the financial crisis. Ex ex very much so. And, and this is uh, something quite interesting that uh, Christine Lagarde mentioned in her talk uh, uh, yesterday, that work at the IMF has shown that there's this systematic relationship between inequality and instability. Um, that uh, a lot of the uh, econometric statistical work at the IMF has bolstered uh, this conclusion. So this is not just these two episodes. Um, and it's not inevitable, it's the way you deal with it, but in both of these instances, it was financial excesses leading to inequality and those financial excesses then leading to economic instability. I mean, as you say, it's within individual countries, within a lot of individual countries, you've had a rising inequality, particularly in the US and the UK, not so much in, in many other European mm -hmm. countries. But at a global level, I guess it would be fair to say that inequality has probably fallen. Inequality between countries or ac across the global population has possibly fallen over the last 20 years. Yep. I mean, we do have to draw a distinction, don't we? Well, uh, there's been a great achievement, and that is the growth of China and, and, and India, uh, these two emerging markets. But if you're sitting on Mars, the distribution you're, of global income and you, and you has don't, become You don't more see equal. any country boundaries, yeah. and you just look at the global distribution of income across people. Um, China's done, you know, moved 500 million people out of poverty. That's done a lot for inequality. Um, there's been a lot of, there's inequality an increase in inequality inside mm. China. But in terms of the disparity between China and the rest of the world, that's obviously uh, come down. But saying. there hasn't been the closing of that disparity mm. uh, between Africa. And so the least developed countries, have, there's not been real convergence in the way that a lot of standard economic theory said there ought to have been. But there is an argument that would say, you know, history will judge taking the very long perspective, the long view, where we're all dead, but just let's say a historian is around still, uh, this might actually be considered a time of growing equality, growing global equality, in which individual countries just had different attitudes to inequality. And the places, there were places like America, which chose to actually allow a massive rise in inequality, which was costly to them in some ways, and other countries that didn't allow that. But the global picture was that it was becoming a more equal world and that opportunities were spreading across the world. Well, within most countries, uh, inequality is growing. So, and most people live in a country. <laughs> so, their neighbors Not affect... in Davos. We don't live in... We have no <laughs> but, nation in Davos. Exactly. But, but what affects people is their immediate surroundings. And if they're living in a context in which there's growing inequality, it has social, political, and I, I'm arguing even economic consequences for that country. So, um, and, and you, you talked about the long run. You know, there, there's this longstanding argument you know, over the long term, won't we grow faster? And that will lift everybody up. That's another sort of uh, old argument that's been totally uh, discredited. Trickle down. Trickle down. And uh, what's so striking is uh, that while the U.S. per capita income has been going up, most Americans have not been participating. Median income, people half above, half below, median income is at the level today that it was in 95, 96. Median wealth is the level that it was in the beginning of the, of, of the 1990s. So two decades in which all the wealth accumulation has gone to the top. Mm -hmm. And if you look at full-time male workers, I, you know, male is only a fraction of the population, but it's an important uh, uh, part of the population. Um, 
uh, the full-time male worker in the United States, median income is today lower than it was in 1968, more than four decades ago. So our labor market has not been working for most uh, for most Americans. And you mentioned wealth. I mean, one of the one of the facts that jumped out at me reading the book is this about the the Walmart heirs. Their combined wealth is about I think it was sixty nine billion seventy billion dollars, which is thirty percent of U.S. wealth. Is that right? Well, no, thirty no, no, percent of the personal. No, that, that it was the same as Sorry, the, the same bottom as, 30 as the bottom the bottom 30%. thirty to forty yeah. percent of all Americans. Yeah. So that one family has the same amount of wealth as the bottom 30 to 40 percent but this is what of the country I mean I talked about the sort of global view I mean there is a sense in which this seems a peculiar I mean a particular problem for the US not just because the figures have been more extreme the, the statistical change but also as you mentioned it was interesting at the start because it goes against something that's quite fundamental to the US psyche this idea that everybody could make it and it strikes me that actually almost makes it harder for people like you to respond to this because there's a perception already that you can make it if you try hard enough in the US and you do get the odd example like the president who can sort of demonstrate this, quite a few presidents. Uh, and there's also a perception that things have become more competitive, that in a sense the economy has got fairer because we feel like we live in this much more competitive uh, level playing field kind of world and yet the reality that you're pointing out in terms of the statistics is the opposite to that. How do you confront that because it actually just goes against very deeply felt perceptions about the world? Yeah, I mean, I mean you're absolutely right because you know newspapers write stories about dogs, uh, not about uh, dogs that bite people, about people that bite dogs and that's because they're unusual. So the success stories are unusual, they get a lot of attention and people think that they're representative stories. And that's why one has to constantly go back to the statistics and get better statistical uh, But there's also bases. a feeling that you would, as an economist, you sort of think that a deregulated society, you know, people think that a, 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 where people are freer to compete, somehow what you get from that competition, you sort of deserve in a way that you might not have deserved it when things were a bit more... Skewed. I mean, like I'm saying you, your, your statistics show that that's not right. Yeah, and, but people and, think and that, that. Now, you're getting into, in part, what are the sources of the inequality? Why, why has it gotten so bad? And there are two parts of that I'll mention. Uh, one part is the important role of education, you know, modern economy. If you're not well educated, it's very hard to compete. And the education that you get is very dependent on what your parents give you. And a couple of interesting statistics. America is becoming increasingly a country with um, economic segregation. In other words, it used to be that poor and rich people lived in proximity. And studies of spatial patterns show that that's increasingly not the case. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, make the mistake of being born and choosing the wrong parents who are not wealthy and uh, uh, you're more likely to live in a school district that is not very good. You won't get the education. Mm -hmm. uh, one statistic, again, that, that, that I think brings us home, uh, American colleges and universities have made a big deal, uh, and rightly so, about being needs blind to mission. If you compete, you do well in those <coughs> exams and you mm -hmm. get good recommendations, they will make up for any economic deficiency. So it looks like it's very, uh, a real opportunity. Only 8% of uh, the students in those selective colleges are from the bottom 50% of America. So the fact is, if you're in the bottom 50%, you don't get the chance, unless you're unusual, very, very unusual, to get the education that gives you this key to, to a future. I guess, I mean, we should get to what can we do about it? What can you do about it with this, um, obviously, you know, understanding and concern about this? I mean, another thing that struck me from your book is you just sort of pointed out in passing, I think, that two-thirds of Americans supported, said they supported the Occupy movement when it was, when it was there in the, in the park in downtown uh, New York. And 
it's true that there does seem, you know, we had this feeling, particularly in the last couple of years, that people were fed up with the system, they don't like the bankers, great unrest. And yet that seems to translate not at all into the political spectrum, the mainstream political I, I, spectrum. I would disagree. I think uh, some of what happened in this last election is a reflection of that. You know, it wasn't the but, only thing. But, it, but a Congress was re-elected that doesn't want to have any, any change in the redistribution of... The Democrats got more than a million more votes than the Republicans. The problem is that we have gerrymandering in the United States. So that even though more than a million more Americans wanted a Democratic Congress, we wound up with a Republican Congress. So, you know, you can say this is an important part of democracy, protecting minority, geographical balance. But in terms of where the majority of Americans are, they voted for a Democratic Congress. Okay, but then if you look at actually the Democratic president's agenda, uh, his great sort of radical step was going to be increasing taxes on people who were earning more than $250,000 a year. I mean, that is not going to solve your problem. No. And it would not, 20 years ago, have been considered a very radical step. So it, it doesn't feel like you would think that there was more of a groundswell for more dramatic changes I, than I that. agree, and that's part of the reason I'm providing the blog, <laughs> was to try to get that groundswell. Well, you're losing your, I'm worried about uh, your voice. It's only but, day two in Davos, and actually, you've already... But, you know. uh, but, but let me uh, say that, that um, I think there's... What's important is to understand the various sources of, of this inequality, and there are many, and then to try to think about what you can do about them, because... Um, there's no magic bullet, there's no single thing. So I said, one of the sources of, of the inequality is this rank-seeking, monopoly power. It's not an accident that if you look at the list of a lot of the wealthiest people, there are people who may have made important contributions, but a large fraction of their income came from uh, exercise of monopoly power. Um, second example, financial sector. I mentioned some of the rank-seeking uh, there. That, in, in a way, there's one law that sort of encapsulates, I think, the imbalance in our legal structure, our bankruptcy law. Most people think of that as an arcane, specialized. Uh, but there was one provision in our bankruptcy law that said, bankruptcy law says, who gets paid first if you can't pay your creditors? Number one were the derivatives. So you write down a law like this, you say derivatives get paid first, you are, in effect, encouraging the growth of derivatives. Mm -hmm. Those speculative you know, uh, instruments that brought down AIG cost us a $180 billion uh, bailout. At the other end, we say student loans cannot be discharged even in bankruptcy. So you make it more difficult for students to make the investment. And you encourage predatory schools for-profit schools that don't give an education and don't enable the student to earn their living to pay back the loans. So within the legal framework, we've put in place some things that have increased inequality at both ends. That's something we've begun to do something about. Uh, Obama did something about the student loan programs in the first term, and I hope he does more about it in the second term. Um, but the, the most important thing is, is the broader issue of, of education. And that links with the, you know, the, the, the topic that we began with, was the price of inequality. Because if it's the case that if you're unlucky in your choice of parents, and you don't get the education that allows you to live up to your potential, you're wasting one of a society's most important resources, the human resources. So that's one of the reasons, only one, but one of the reasons why inequality is bad for our society and for our economy. So you'd have investment in education, uh, th these kind of quite important ch legal changes that are sort of skewing the system, and uh, tr more traditional redistributive taxation, maybe going back to where things were in America, oh, you know, 10 years ago, not so long ago. Yeah, I'm just wondering, that there's one other thing which has come up a lot in the British context, and actually it's something that the leader of the opposition has talked a bit about, though he has a horrible name for it, pre-distribution. But basically what he's trying to get at is this idea that, you know, you can have all the redistributive taxes in the world, but you're going to have to pay an awful lot 
to try and equalise or, or to help people um, have a decent income, if that's your focus. If the wages that are coming out of our, of our system are consistently too low for people to live. So, you know, is, is there some way that you can be trying to, you know, to have a living wage or uh, raising the minimum wage? Look, I mean, do you think that should be part of it? Yeah, very much so. And I thought it was very interesting yesterday Then Christine Lagarde talked about minimum wage as part of the IMF agenda. <laughs> a very big change from where they used to be. But no, I think minimum wages, collective bargaining, are all important instruments for you call, what you call pre-distribution. If you can think of a better name for it, I think yeah, the Labour Party would be very happy yeah. to hear from you. There, there's something else that, that um, you know, part of the debate about the role of market forces is um, the decrease the demand for certain types of labor driven down the wages. Technical change doesn't just occur, it, it, it's, it's self-guided by our policies. If we had stronger policies to s save the environment, to reduce global warming, and diverted our resources, our innovative resources, to saving the planet rather than creating more unemployment, we would have a, a better pre-distribution of income. And who's getting it right, do you think? I mean, if you point to countries, and maybe not countries that have just always been pretty different in their approach to equality, but you mentioned Brazil. I mean, countries that have actually seen some of this and then have taken, have seen, have taken steps which didn't actually damage their economy. Well, as I say, I mean, obviously, yeah. the Scandinavian countries have been the <laughs> most consistent in, in pushing this kind of, of agenda. And in, in their... Well, they've had very, I mean, they've changed where they spend their money. They've had quite radical changes in the way the government spends money. They haven't just stuck with an old welfare Oh, no, no they've, they've readjusted. I mean, one yeah. of the things, they, they've, they've uh, uh, recognized that it's very important to get full participation in the labor force. So they've had active labor market policies to make sure that you retrain workers so that they're more receptive to change, so that they won't be unemployed, they get re-enter. Act, uh, policies to make sure that women can be active in the labor market so that they, um, uh, all kinds of, you might call, supportive po policies and, and gender neutral policies so that both the uh, husband and the wife take uh, family leave when a baby is born. So they've, they've done a lot of things to try to make sure that there is uh, uh, greater labor supply and greater equality through that mechanism. Now, uh, here at Davos, they want you to always talk about, near the end, they want you to talk about your vision for the future. If, you, if, if people started to move or if countries started to respond in the way that you're talking about, um, do you think America would look fundamentally different? I mean, what would be your vision for, for the future if these trends, if there was measures taken that were trying to sort of slow down some of these yeah, trends? Let me make one point first. What, one of the reasons we were talking about the American model being uh, exceptional because it's, it's the worst in that way. The problem is that a lot of countries have always looked to America as mm -hmm. something to emulate. And again, one of the reasons for my writing the book is to say there are a lot of good things about uh, the United States, but there are these policies that have led to a lot of inequality that are not policies that you would want to emulate. So more broadly, I think we could go back, you know, the period after World War II, just say in the United States, was a period between 19, in World War II and 1980, was a period of our most rapid growth and a period in which we all grew together. And my, so my vision of the future is another period of that kind. Um, obviously, the world is different. It's a different structure of the economy. But the argument that globalization means that everybody has to be worse off is a peculiar argument because we say, what is the point of globalization? It's supposed to make us all better off. And then to say, well, the way we're going to respond to globalization is to make sure wages are down, social benefits are cut. That doesn't make any sense. So what I would like is, is a, a vision where we have a clear view that the ob object of economic activity is increasing the well-being of most of our citizens. That's the object. And if we fail that, 
our economy has failed. I'm told I have to finish very promptly at 20 past, so a very short answer to this. I talked about you becoming more radical. If, you, if, if things carry on this way, you know, Marx would have said this is just inherent in the capitalist system, this rent-seeking, this rising inequality. Will you eventually be out on the barricades calling for revolution, do you think? Uh, I don't think he's inherent. Yeah. Uh, and that's, it, 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 if I th didn't think there was hope, I would not have written the book. I, I really do think that uh, there, I think this is enervating our economy. This inequality is enervating our economy. And that the kinds of reforms would make our economy more dynamic and resilient. Thank you very much. Joe Stiglitz.